You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by iWokeUp, flexible loans built for small businesses. Today, we are in Matera. Cozze cittele, cozze, cozze vicine, non spigude cicora, non spigude cicora. Cipo's first retirement, 2002. Who could have guessed that underneath the designer stubble, the Armani suits and the Via Veneto good looks, apart from the cheetah he kept as a house pet, his disco prowling and frequent service as a judge at beauty contests, away from such celebrated friends as Ronaldo and Michael Schumacher, all Mario Cipollini sought, like you and me, was love and respect. He wasn't getting any, he said, despite more than 170 victories in bicycle races during his 14-year professional career. Or maybe he wasn't getting enough. Cipo was a tad unclear when he announced his retirement. Ciao, he explained. I'll be back only if the sport misses me. Cipo's second retirement, 2005. Once again, Mario Cipollini has announced his definite, absolute, unswerving and irrevocable decision to retire, and this time he means it, probably. Unlike previous decisions to hang his bicycle in his garage forever, which were always made in peak, this one sounded sincere. Announcing my withdrawal one week before the Giro d'Italia is a painful but honest decision, he said. The public will understand. Well, Mario Cipollini there, two of his retirements didn't stop at that, of course. Um, and we're going to be talking about the, the, the later part of Mario Cipollini's career in this episode. Those two passages were by our colleague Sam Abd, the wonderful uh, New York Times reporter who covered the Tour de France for many years and had a very dry sense of humour. And I think some of that humour um, comes across in those two passages dealing with Cipollini's uh, you know, announcements. So the first one in 2002 actually, uh, you know, because his team hadn't been invited to the Tour de France, but he obviously came back very uh, quickly and won the World Championship that year. Um, and the second one appeared final. He was 38 by then. But it wasn't, of course. And we'll talk a little bit about that in this episode. Where are we, Lionel? Well, we're in Matera, down in the south of Italy. We're in Puglia, aren't we, Daniel? We're in Basilicata. Ah. Nearly in Puglia. But it's where Mario Cipollini won two, two of his Giro stages... One in 1998 and one in 2000. And, uh, well, he had a chance to draw level with Alfredo Binder on 41 in 2003. But that slipped by. But we'll hear about that in a little bit. Just a couple of brief notes about the, the route, Napalm. Um, we, we are going to be rolling past Civita. Remember Civita um, from the Giro of a couple of years ago? The little Albanian enclave. Um, it was a community um, created by Albanian refugees about five centuries ago. And they still speak a version of Albanian there. We had some cracking food there, didn't we? Mm, we did. I um, think, think we recorded an episode of Kilometre Zero approaching midnight that that day you sound you sound slightly tired now um <laughs> and we're on our way to matera matera um you will have seen matera in films because it's a popular choice um as a location when jerusalem or ancient jerusalem is being depicted it's often filmed in matera um beautiful city and um i wanted to get the best possible view of it with the route so the stage is going to finish on a gravel road just outside Matera. Beautiful view of the sunset over the, the city of stones, they call it in Italy. Probably not very practical, but, you know. Well, Mario Cipollini wouldn't like it, would he? And I'm not sure uh, whether I'll like it either. Um, the, the final 24.3 kilometres make up our Giro on the RGT platform. If you want to ride along with our Giro, go to rgtcycling.com slash our hyphen Giro and you can... Uh, you, well, you can join in. You don't have to, you know, catch up on the stages that have gone so far. You can uh, join in. Let's head over to the course and see who is struggling up one of the climbs this afternoon. So I've been pedalling for an hour. On paper, this is one of the flatter stages of our Giro. One of the shortest as well, but the Giro is pretty old school, isn't it? As we know, very, very rarely a metre of flat. And, uh, well, I've got a few kilometres still to go. The question is, regarding this view of Matera at the finish, is the juice worth the squeeze, to borrow a phrase from Daniel? We'll see. 
4.4 kilometers to go. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by IWACA. Flexible loans built for small businesses. IWOCA.co.uk Thanks to IWACA, our title sponsor. IWACA are an award-winning finance company who specialise in lending to small businesses. Uh, they have issued more than £1 billion to companies ranging from startups to established businesses. Uh, IWACA can lend between £1,000 and £250,000. And by making it quick and easy to apply for a loan and get a quick decision, it can be a more flexible option than approaching the big banks. IWACA also very keen on cycling, supporting their employees to ride to work and sponsoring the Kendall Cycle Club and, of course, the Cycling Podcast. For more information, go to iwaka.co.uk. Giro Dream Team with Ciro Scognamiglio. La zona nulle sette. Mark Cavendish, uh, dear Mark, I must confess for the first time in my life how many times we speak before or after a race, not possible to count them. But in any case, I never, never, never understood a single word of what you said to me, dear Mark. Simply too difficult for me, your accent from the eyes of man. So, Mark, a lot of times when I have to translate your words, I invent at least 90% of them. But maybe it has been an improvement. Who knows? Well, that was Chiro Scognamilio with the latest pick for his dream team. Uh, and it was Mark Cavendish. And we're going to hear from Mark Cavendish in this episode, aren't we? Yes, and Mark Cavendish actually listened to that. Um, he got a, a sneak preview of that little clip and he loved it. Oh, well, I bet he did, of course. I mean, to make to make Giro's dr- dr- dream team. How uh, How is Chiro? Well, we're going to find out who his team manager is later, but I wonder how um, Mark Cavendish and Elia Radio Viviani are going to dovetail in Chiro's dream team. I wonder. We're going to hear from Elia Viviani as well in this episode, aren't we? So we'll see how they dovetail in this in this episode. But well, it's a, it's no, an un- no room it's- no room for Cipollini then in in Chiro's dream team. Co- complicated oh, yeah. relations between Gazetta della Sport. And I think Cipollini, they've probably but, fought. They've probably we'll fought over that. the same beach at some point in the last yeah. fifteen years. Yeah, I fancy Cipollini to come out on top in that in that scrap. Um, but uh, yeah, an unconventional team that Chiro's putting together, but guaranteed uh, entertainment, I, I think. So, um, so Lionel, are you going to... You, you, in the last episode, you talked us through some of the milestones in Cipollini's career. We're heading towards one of his retirements now, I think. Yeah, into the twilight, really. 2002, Cipollini rode for the Aqua e Saponi team, won the world title, as we mentioned in yesterday's episode. And so he wore the rainbow jersey when he transferred to the Domino Vacanze team for 2003. And one of the early pictures in the early part of the season was of him hurling water bottles at photographers in Ghent Wevergem. Um, just another kind of just an ordinary day in the life of Mario Cipollini by this stage. At this point, he was on 40 Giro d'Italia stage wins, one behind Alfredo Binda. And uh, going into the 2003 Giro, there were a lot of sprint stages, but uh, Alessandro Pataki, Fabio Baldato, Robbie McEwen, all won stages before Cipollini drew level with Binda by winning in Arezzo. And then the following day, he set a new record, 42 Giro d'Italia stage wins by winning in Monte Catini Terme. And uh, well, the season wasn't perfect for him because the team were left out of the Tour de France again, despite him being the world champion. And at the Vuelta later in the season, he rode the prologue and then went home. Simple as that. So Cipollini. The following year, 2004, Cipollini was back at the Tour for a swan song, riding for Domina Vacanze in their zebra print kit. Quite an unusual one, that, for the Lion King, wasn't it? Well, I remember being at the start of stage one in that Tour de France, and um, I was interviewing, I think I was interviewing either Magnus Backstead or Scott Sunderland, and I heard a bit of a commotion, or I heard a sort of thudding noise behind me, and I turned around and I saw Chippo riding to the start, being chased by a pride of pantomime lions. (laughs) 
I mean, I mean we, heard, we heard at the start as well, we had a discussion the other day, didn't we, about whether any, any rider had ever been called the cheetah. Um, he had a, a pet cheetah, apparently. So I don't think he did. I think that, Sam that got that wrong. Urban... I think he might have got that wrong. There was a photo. There was a photo shoot once. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, no, that rings a bell. That rings a bell, yeah. Okay. Well, that was enough. our episode picture for yesterday. <laughs> um, with his with his little little kitten cub, um, that tour was not without controversy for Cipollini because he tried to persuade his Domina Vacanze team bosses not to pick Filippo Simeone for the Tour de France team. Uh, the suggestion was that uh, well, Lance Armstrong was very unhappy that Simeone had. Uh, basically testified against Dr. Michele Ferrari and the story was that Armstrong put pressure on Cipollini to put pressure on the team bosses to leave Simeone out of the tour and well we know how that all uh, wrapped up eventually so um, yeah Cipollini throwing his weight around but didn't get his way because Simeone did ride that 2004 tour. Cipollini's last season was really just a few months with Liquid Gas in 2005, best known really for riding the a ceremonial prologue of the Giro. The Giro that year started with a twilight prologue, just a, a little over a kilometre down in Reggio Calabria. It was won by Brett Lancaster just along the seafront, wasn't it, with, uh, with all the lights um, making it quite a spectacle. And Cipollini, after the last rider had gone, Cipollini rode in a quite a striking pink skin suit with sort of silver veins on it and the the names of all of the 42 uh, stage wins that he had in the Giro not the only uh, ridiculous skin suit that Cipollini had worn in his time he as he'd had a, a sort of a, a, a lion print one or you know some kind of cat print one there was uh, there was the one that was the Seiko one that looked like uh, a, a human body with a skin removed that was a bit uh, but a bit unusual didn't didn't look great did it but uh, always pushing the envelope when it came to his skin suits <laughs> and that was it that's that was the point that we thought that's the end of mario cipollini of course it wasn't but we'll come that was that. that that was it napalm he went out with a bit of a whimper off sort of very faint meow those last few um months at liquid gas and there was a lot of, there was a lot of flouncing in the last three or four years of his career, flouncing about not being appreciated enough. And you know, Cipollini, um, he was this odd mix at times between great modesty. He would always make um, make a point of whenever he, he came near to a milestone like Binder's um, milestone of stage wins in the jury, he would make a point of saying, I'm only a sprinter. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not fit to polish riders like Binder's or Merckx's shoes. Um, and then great sort of, sanctimony and and you know um immodesty i suppose um in in the same way you know another contradiction he used to sort of emphasize the fact that he was a he was a tuscan peasant that he came from very humble stock um but on the other hand you know he would embrace all the sort of trappings and luxuries of of superstardom um and you know the the last few years of his career was sort of characterized by those contradictions just in those last few months, he rode for Liquid Gas. Um, one of his direct sportives at Liquid Gas was Stefano Zanata, and he has some fond memories of Cipollini. He was someone to be feared if you did something wrong, in inverted commas. He was a sheriff, but that was just him. Back then, leaders were leaders, and they demanded 100% from everyone. He came to us to Liquid Gas for his last three months as a rider, and he was still very charismatic. He worked for the team, did what he had to do, having been the last rider in the door when the team was already built. He followed my orders in races when I gave them, but yeah, there was this funny little episode at the Tirreno that year. Mario used to be ready early in the morning and generally went to the start in the Fiat Ulisse we had, with his old masseur Mugnaini. Anyway, this one morning he wasn't the first down and when he came out of the hotel he saw one of our other riders, Mauro Gerosa, was sitting in the front seat of the Ulisse. Mario just loomed over him and then said, hey, how many races have you won? When you've won as many as me, you can sit in the front, get out and get in the back. Poor Gerosa tried to mumble something to the effect that he had won a few things, but anyway, yeah. It was an incident that became a bit of a joke in the team hotel at night. When Gerosa appeared, someone would invariably say to him, hey, where are you sitting in the car tomorrow?
Well, the preeminent current Italian sprinter is Elia Viviani, a very different uh, character and personality to Mario Cipollini. But I spoke to Viviani recently about Cipollini um, and about his relationship with him because, to my surprise, they, they are quite close. I, I think about Cipollini, for sure, you can love how he win for sure, but also the personality, you know, is one of the only probably uh, Italian rider in the past and in and also in the modern cycling. No, uh, no, a lot of Italian riders are like Cipollini. He was like one like uh, a real top level sportsman also outside of cycling. Like uh, uh, he joined, I don't know, the TV um Sport, the, the TV world and uh, I don't know the the gossip world. It was really uh, one when he do something, the people just talking about this, you know. And the character he had, for example, that that year in in the world champion jersey in Gambelberg and the reaction he had sometimes with contenders, with jury or with uh, it was like. Cipollini as a rider, the complete rider. Mario is still uh, riding a lot of on the bike, so he has now some... Uh, I speak with him really... Uh, well, not a lot, but uh, sometimes we speak together because we are closer uh, with some people, important people in cycling, like um, Federico Zecchetto from DMT on my side, and he is the producer of his Cipollini bike. So... Um, and sometimes we see, we meet at some dinner, and uh, yeah, it's always nice to listen what uh, he think. For sure, the cycling is uh, in this past, in, in the last few years, is changed. It's not anymore the cycling when cheap it was rider. But um, yeah, for sure, I always listen what he have to say to me, and some a lot of times uh, it's true what he say. So, um, for example, how much he followed the dream of Sanremo. Uh-huh. That that is, it was like the race. He he really can't win every every year. He tried, but he can't win. And then that year, then uh, it was his magical year when he won Sanremo, Gambelli, again, everything. The Cycling Podcast at our Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science in Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. To get 25% off, go to scienceinsport.com and enter the code. Daniel, what's the code? Uh, 21, 25. Science in Sport, 25. Oh S I S C P twenty five, absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> the panic in your eyes at that point. Still wearing your Seiko hat there, um, your little tribute to Mario Cipollini's golden years. Um, hope you, hope you took it sport. off overnight. That hat. I don't actually think it is the right one. I think this one is of the sort of two thousand two Kunigo. Yeah, the it's Kunigo more Kunigo one. Simone vintage. Scienceandsport dot com with the code S I S C P twenty five. Do, do try and remember that for the next time, Daniel. I will chuck the ball to you like that again. Anyway, um, let's carry on. Mario Cipollini. Are we, are we at his... Um, what retirement are we at now, Lionel? Uh, uh, well, uh, the official one. The actual what? one that, where he the did retire. One. Yeah, in, first, in, for the first time, 2005. Yeah, in 2005, he, he did actually call it quits, didn't he? He, he stayed very active, um, active in the sense that um, well, he separated from his wife, um, Sabrina Landucci, and um, yeah, he was snapped in flagrante, about as in flagrante as you can get with a, a glamour model, Magda Gomez, on a Sardinian beach in 2006. He was in all the gossip uh, magazines. Um, yeah, a very, a very graphic picture of them enjoying themselves on the beach. And then in 2008, he announces a comeback with the Rock Racing Team, in itself controversial, Cipollini by now just a month or so shy of his 41st birthday. Uh, the best result in the Tour of California was third place in a stage behind Tom Bonin and Heinrich Hausler. Mark Cavendish famously rode past him in the time trial stage with one foot unclipped. Uh, 2008 was also a tricky year because he had a brush with the tax authorities in Italy. 
something dating back to around a decade before 98-99 and initially was instructed to pay 1.1 million euros but that was overturned on appeal a few years later so uh, well you know um, rich sports people and tax it can sometimes be a a, a tricky old relationship can't it uh, but Cipollini's comeback with rock racing I mean it was a marriage made in both heaven and hell really wasn't it well you mentioned the tour of California and the comeback race Lionel, um, let's hear from Mark Cavendish. Daniel, you spoke to uh, Mark about about that race and about Mario Cipollini. Oh, mate, it was mint. I used to have posters of Chippo on me bedroom wall, you know. Them, uh, them Brico helmets with the with the big free holes in the front and that, you know. Um, it was it was pretty cool to you know be able to race with him. I never thought our careers would overlap. But uh, oh, I was buzzing about it. I thought, like, the idea and philosophy behind rock racing was, you know, it was something that I think the whole idea, whether, whether like, people like the brand or, or what it's about is a different thing. But uh, the fact that, um, you know, they were trying to make cycling cool, you know, um, I think that's quite... Before the time, really, you know, cycling was getting big in America. Well, it had got big because of lands, but still, um, it was, it was, it was quite niche, you know. Like, like you were a bit of an outcast if you shaved your legs and and wore lycra, you know. So to be able to make it quite cool and young, it it, it had a philosophy of bringing a whole new audience in. I think, you know, and uh, and people who were currently cycling fans could. I think they could appreciate it by names that they grew up with, you know. But uh, to be fair, like Chippo, it was a good call to have the likes of Chippo because there weren't many riders that could transcend the sport. Then Lance did. Um, and then I think Chippo came mainly in Italy, but um, he had the ability to transcend the sport. You know, I think the cycling wasn't big enough then to have us a superstar that wasn't Lance. Like, Lance is a different person altogether, you know? But, uh, like the Chippo, um, I think if he'd have spoken English, he would have been one of them riders that, that completely transcended cycling, you know? And we got to the time trial, and uh, I started a minute behind Chippo, I think, you know? Like, look, like, it was more supposed to be... If, if I knew how things work with particularly cycling journalists... There's certain like cycling websites that can make a they can make a negative story out of out of anything, can't they? Do you know? I didn't really look at the world in that way in in that time. You know, I was only young, and if I knew kind of what I know now and how things can really get blown up, it, for sure I wouldn't do anything now. You know, but I was young and didn't know, and uh, in my in my eyes. I was a minute behind Chippo. If I catch Chippo, it's just me and Chippo on the road. So it's a private thing. Do you know what I mean? Like it had, I had no... That like was completely naive to think that there'd actually be people there, you know? Like it was just, just young stupidity on my behalf. And, uh, yeah, when I caught Chippo, um, it was actually something I think... Who, who told me they'd done it? It might have been Charlie Wigelius, like, when I was, like, an amateur... I think like the Madrid Worlds when Charlie was riding, and he was telling the story at the dinner table where uh, someone passed him one legged, or he passed someone one legged in a time trial. And so uh, I got to chip. I hadn't planned it, but then when I caught him, um, I just took took one of my feet out and just rode past him one leg, but smiled, and he smiled in that. And uh, there was no cameras or anything like that. So as far as I was aware, it was a it was a private thing, you know. Um, and uh, and that was it. it and then uh, yeah turns out that was there was a car behind with a few journalists and weren't there like typical and uh, one of them went up he, he, he asked Chippo what that was about and then uh, it didn't blow up but it, it kicked off a little bit didn't it so so that was Mark Cavendish about that extraordinary 2008 um, edition of the Tour of California with Cipollini's comeback. Um, I, I, I had a great 
hour or so with Cipollini on the Rock Racing bus one day. Um, Hugo Corvitz and I were invited onto the Rock Racing bus, and and Mark, you know, talked there about how well they were trying to reinvent the wheel. Really, there was a lot of kind of glamour, Cadillacs, music blaring out of the team bus in the morning, and and the bus itself was kind of a, a bit of a sort of mobile you know, Playboy Mansion, um, all sort of orchestrated by Michael Ball, who was this very gregarious impresario um, fashion um, mogul who would set up the team. And, you know, I interviewed Cipollini on the bus and there were all these sort of um, live models draped on um, the seats of the bus and almost, um, you know, it was quite difficult at times. Did Hugo, to, tell, did Hugo tell you to pay attention? Yes, pay attention, freebie, pay attention, huh? Cipollini, yeah. And um, yeah, the, 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 there were these sort of models um, strategically positioned all around the bus and, um, you know, it was quite difficult to, to they were so sort of um, kind of intertwined with Cipollini at times it was difficult to know who was wearing which piece of clothing um, all while I was trying to interview him about you know the sprint he'd done the previous day um, and you know I mean one thing to, to say about that tour of California was yeah. that um, he was remarkably competitive um, it, he almost won one stage um, he was in very good shape and you know I, I must confess guiltily that when his when his comeback burned out, I think immediately afterwards, I don't think he rode another race. I was slightly disappointed because it had been a fantastic story. Yeah, he'd, he'd always said, hadn't he, that he would need about four weeks training to come back and uh, compete um, and beat, basically, his, his successors. And I, it seemed like his comeback was all about just proving that point or or making that point. Yeah, I mean, he ultimately he ultimately lost the um, he lost out in the comparison with well his successor Mark Cavendish. Cavendish was um, very much on the up at that time. Two thousand eight, he hadn't ridden his first Tour de France yet, but it was it was pretty clear that he was going to be um, one of the dominant sprinters, if not the dominant sprinter. And and um, just in speaking to Mark uh, earlier this week, Rich, I was obviously intrigued to know you know what he thought at the time about Cipollini, what he um, thinks about him today, um, but also just um, when he watches the the sprints that Cipollini won and that era, the 90s, what strikes him immediately about how how they're different from sprints of the last 10 years or so? First and foremost is the, the lack of helmet. Like, that blows me away. Like, but it blows... Like, when I think back now, t- only... 10, 11 years ago, I never, ever wore a helmet training. And it it makes me feel sick to think that. But to think that they were sprinting then um, is nuts. But I think the biggest difference I can definitely see between now and then is um, the lack of, like, lead-out trains. It literally is the sprinters and maybe one guy putting them into position each, you know? Whereas now you've got where where there with it within the last five hundred meters you had twenty guys going for the win. Now you've got eighty, ninety guys going for the same space because you still got all the all the trains trying to make it happen, you know. Um, and uh, there's a lot more movement in it then, you know. Um, I know for one, I'm scared to make movement now because you probably get relegated for it, you know. It depends what you kind of look at it on, you know. I've won a green jersey. I've won 30 stages of the tour. I think, uh, what do you take it on? Like, he won Gemp Evelgem, but uh, it was a different race then. You know, I dreamed of winning Gemp Evelgem when I was younger. Not even dreamed it. I, I target it as an objective, but it's a completely different race now. Where there was four climbs, even 10 years ago, there was only four climbs. Now there's 20 and all that gravel. So it's a completely different race, you know. It was a sprinter's race, but you, like San Remo, it was a sprinter's race, but a sprinter had to work to get there. It wasn't a guaranteed sprint, you know? Whereas now it's 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 a full-blown classic, you know? So you can't compare, say, Gem Bevelgem as a win to see, but uh, I don't know, really. Um, well, I do, but I've got to be modest, and I? It might just be the, the personality of a sprinter, but if you ask Chippo, who do you think the best... Who was better out of Chippo and I? Chip would say Chippo. But if you ask me, who do I think is better out of Chippo and I? I'm going to say me. 
it might just be a sprint of personality, but at the end of the day, it's not a... It, it, it doesn't really matter. Like, who are you going to ask who's, who's the greatest sprint of all time? Like, someone... Uh, uh, do, do you know what I mean? Like, actually, I spoke to Brad a lot about it. Brad says that like, when you retire, like, things have a way of settling into to how you're rated in history, do you know? Race wins are race wins. What you do for the sport is another thing. Who actually has a thought on it in the sport is another thing completely. Can I ask you a question? Who do you think? Go and write on an internet forum, Daniel. Well, Daniel, um, interesting to hear, not for the first time, Mark Cam just turned the tables on his inquisitor. Um, who, what did you go and write on, on your internet forum? Which what forum, was your forum which, of which, choice? Which forum would I have scuttled off to? I'm not really familiar with the forums. The forums. MySpace, as, as Mark Daniel would have been on them. MySpace, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what did you write, Daniel? Well, what did you write? Well, yeah, I think we should probably try to answer the question. Um, I, I mean, I, I think Mark did not want to say there, but feels... Um, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here. And the, the doping question has to be taken into account. And, you know, we, we've found out in the last few years that um, the, there are long shadows that have been cast over Cipollini's career. And, and I certainly feel that. Um, even if you were to take that out of the equation, um, the, I think the, the ultimate arena um, for sprinters is the Tour de France. Cavendish won 30, has won 30 Tour de France stages. Cipollini won 12. You can't sniff at the 42 Giro stage wins that Cipollini won, or indeed the 191, I think it is, pro pro um, victories. They're extraordinary numbers. Um, but I think Cavendish definitely wins out, um, even if you... Do look at them in isolation, those figures, and strip out any other sort of extra sporting context. And, and I guess we'll move on to that in a minute. Well, yeah. I mean, Cipollini, Cipollini on Cavendish um, a few years ago said um, he was strong. Um, he was never a heavyweight. He was lucky to come into a power vacuum when the world heavyweight title was vacant and to have a train that made it like a stroll for him. Um, I mean, that, 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 I mean, is that fair? It is. It, I mean, it's very difficult to evaluate the the respective is generations, isn't it? But yeah, I mean, yeah. Certain, I, sorry, yeah. go on. You, no, but you can you could say the same about what Cipollini and his train in the in the late nineties. You know, the psycho train. The, the, you know, if if a team and a sprint is dominant, they do make it look as if it's easy. That's kind of the point, and and. When you've got that, it doesn't mean that everybody else isn't very good. It just means that they are extremely dominant. The other thing in in Cavendish's favour, I would say that he was a much more versatile sprinter. Um, he started off in the first couple of seasons when he was winning a lot, winning without much of a train and could win from pretty much any position. And then, um, as always happens, the strongest sprinter in the world then starts getting sort of a, a team built around him and that's what happened with Cavendish and he did have a very good train and he could also win in those circumstances so and I don't think anybody could accuse Mark Cavendish of not having respect for races and I think that's part of his legacy too you know even struggling to finish that stage of the Tour de France a couple of years ago when he was outside the time limit he always uh, he he didn't you know pull a Cipollini and disappear off to the beach as soon as he hit the mountains. That that for him was as much a part of the Tour de France as as winning the sprints. One slight mm, sort of asterisk or, or or question mark and the longevity question mark. Cipollini's was impressive um, to have won. Uh, Giro stage in 1989, and then to still be winning Giro stage in 2003. But you mentioned the, the, the doping shadows and, and when they came to light a few years after he'd retired in Gazzetta della Sport, um, a lot of them focused on his alleged involvement with uh, Dr. Fuentes, later caught up in Operación Puerto, of course. And in particular, his preparation for the World Championships in 2002 and around that time. Um, and it is very difficult to disentangle you know, Cipollini, the great sprinter, with these very serious allegations which just kind of hang around like a bad smell don't they because for all his claims that he was going to sue Gazetta and, and clear his name it's just kind of been allowed to um to, to to sit there and and it does make you know any assessment of Cipollini's legacy as an athlete extremely difficult 
especially when added to the French Senate list, which was published in 2004 after some samples from 98 were retested. Of course, 1998, there was no test for EPO. By 2004, there was. And so they retested a whole batch of uh, samples taken at the Tour de France. And Cipollini's name was on a list of um, positive tests that or well, samples that showed up EPO uh, you know an allegation that was strongly denied by Cipollini and his lawyers of course as as they would be but you know when uh, stacking up evidence on one side and uh, mitigation on the other you know it it adds to a picture doesn't it it, it certainly does chaps and um you know just to just to explain a little bit about how he came to be linked with Fuentes um, it took a while he certainly wasn't in the first sort of batch of um of riders who were alleged to have links with Fuentes, but um, there was there were documents in the Fuentes files seized from Fuentes' apartments in Madrid um, with a phone number, a mysterious phone number, which appeared next to the code name Maria. Um, the telephone number, the mobile telephone number, was Mario Cipollini's. Uh, mobile phone number which he had been using for years and years and there were journalists in Italy who had figured this out um, there was also a calendar there uh, of races for I, I can't remember whether it was 2002 or 2003 season and it matched exactly the races that Cipollini rode that year and it was the only he was the only Italian rider who had though had that race program um, and the, the extent of the doping um, that Cipollini is is was alleged to have undertaken was pretty shocking. Um, you know, two blood bags um, in the couple of weeks before the Zolda World Championships in 2002, and 25 blood bags the next season, um, which um, is probably some kind of world record. Again, allegations which haven't been proven, but um, the legal challenge to La Gazzetta, which published the um, allegations, um, it sort of fizzled out. And then in the last couple of years, things have taken a, an even darker and more serious turn, haven't they? In 2018, Cipollini's sister filed charges against him for threatening behaviour and uh, him threatening to strangle her, which she dropped those um, allegations later. And then in 2019, a case brought by his ex-wife for stalking bodily harm and abuse, which is going through the courts now, Daniel. It is going through the courts at the moment, Lionel. The first thing to say here is that we hope to have the lawyer representing Sabrina Landucci, so Cipollini's ex-wife, um, on here today. She agreed to speak to us a few days ago, but um, since then has stopped taking calls, and um, I don't know whether she had cold feet or not, but um, her name is Donatella Campione, Campione, of course, uh, meaning champion or sample, as in sample you give it a an anti-doping test um, just a coincidence I think and the case itself is obviously no laughing matter um, the last the last update we had before everything went into lockdown um, was the well it came with the testimony of Sabrina Landucci's mum which really confirmed a lot of what Sabrina Landucci had had accused Maria Cipollini of, do, of having done um, in her own testimony in October last year so there was lots of there were lots of allegations of threats um, violence Going back really throughout the course of their marriage and we said, I think we said yesterday that uh, Mario Cipollini and Sabrina Landucci got married in 1993. The, the incident that brought it all to a head and um, prompted Sabrina Landucci to press charges was uh, an alleged attack, assault at her workplace in January 2017. Um, in the meantime, she and Mario Cipollini had obviously got divorced and she had started seeing dating a, a former footballer um, someone who used to play for Kiev or uh, Silvio Giusti, I think his name is. And um, yeah, she claimed that that day um, Mario Cipollini attacked her physically and verbally. Um, both in her testimony and the testimony of her mum, there was talk of um, death threats in the past of Mario Cipollini holding a gun to Sabrina's head um, on more than one occasion, threatening to kill her. A lot of a lot of this, um, according to Sabrina Landucci's version of events, um, seems to come about because of jealousy, um, and 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 that explains in part why there's also a stalking charge um, in this case. Often his ire would be provoked, she said, by her wearing, for example, short skirts to work. There was one claim that um, he'd he'd sawn a bike in two. He'd bought her a bike, but then 
he'd subsequently sawn it in two because one day she went to a she went to work in a skirt that was too short for his liking um and and generally she painted a pretty a pretty well as you can imagine a very unflattering picture of mario cipollini talk of repeated affairs incessant affairs over the course of their marriage um his case and his defence, it seems, is is going to rest or certainly be strengthened um, in his eyes by the fact that the their two daughters, Raquel and Lucrezia, have not corroborated um, what Sabrina Landucci has has claimed thus far. Um, they have said that their parents, yes, they rowed on occasion, but they didn't see any violence or assault or anything that could back up the charges that are being pressed here. Um, other people have backed them up. For example, the cleaning lady at, um, the old cleaning lady at Mario Cipollini and Sabrina Landucci's um, former residence. So uh, we, we don't really know where it's going to go from here. That was one of the things we wanted to find out from Sabrina Landucci's lawyer. Um, Mario Cipollini, as you can imagine, is very angry and defensive about all of this. The story has been getting an awful lot of coverage, very forensic coverage actually in the local press, uh, Gazzetta di Luca. Um, in particular, if you understand Read Italian, I encourage you to go and read what they've written about the case. Um, the other day, one of their latest report um, related to the case was from one of their journalists who was in a queue at a supermarket and um, he wasn't wearing a face mask. Um, Mario Cipollini spotted him, um, approached him, whipped out his mobile phone and took a picture and, and sort of threatened that he was going to exact some kind of revenge by taking a picture publishing a picture of this journalist without a face mask once again we don't know exactly what the, the sort of timeline or time scale of the case is going to be from here um, we do think that Mario Cipollini uh, risks up to well between six months and, and six years um, imprisonment and um, those are the sort of standard penalties standard sentences for the things he's accused of and we'll obviously be following the case with great interest over the next few months yeah well that that case is is obviously ongoing and as you said Lionel it, it's pretty dark and and it, it does you know the the we, we did say at the start of this two-parter that that the shades get darker as we as we talk through um, Mario Cipollini's career and life post cycling, he also had a brush with death um, towards the end of last year. Five hour heart surgery um, to correct an artery anomaly, um, which was a, a very serious condition. Obviously, that's a, a major operation, um, and uh, uh, he seems to have recovered uh, from that okay. But certainly. Um, you know, life and retirement for Cipollini has has not not been doesn't seem like it's been dull. We have seen him on occasions. I remember Daniel being with you at the Tour de France in 2013 in Corsica, and we were driving the the course. I think it was stage two uh, through the interior of the island. Um, it might have been stage three actually. I can't remember, but we we came up on the course itself behind a. Very large looking, very muscled and bronzed uh, figure riding topless on his bike. And it was Mario Cipollini, of course. Um, that was the last time I saw him. But you do you do see him at uh, at the Giro um, in his, you know, open white shirt, jeans, um, looking, uh, you know, terrible cutting jeans. a dash. Terrible well, jeans, cut, aren't cut, they? Cutting, yeah, terrible jeans, but cutting a dash. And... I guess the question is, with all this, you know, the the the, the doping allegations, the the domestic violence allegations, um, what's that done for his reputation in Italy and his standing in Italy? I mean, you know, here in the UK, I, I think of somebody like Linford Christie, for example, who, uh, former Olympic hundred meter champion, who had doping allegations at the the later part of his career and a, a positive test and it really tarnished his reputation and he, he's sort of persona non grata, but it's not that conclusive there's a there's a sort of there's enough of a question mark around for him to still um you know participate in certain things but not in others and is it that is it complicated with Cipollini or um is he uh, still a, a, a kind of popular public figure or is he more of a controversial public figure now yeah it's a good question rich um you know i mentioned 
um, Berlusconi earlier and um, you know sometimes I look back at some of the things that Cipollini has said over the last few years I mean comparing Contador and Schleck in 2011 tour to a pair of show ponies or gays and um, you know there are real echoes of of Berlusconi I mean um, Cipollini made those comments a, a few months after um, Berlusconi had sort of triumphantly announced at a, at a trade fair when you know there were all sorts of allegations about these bunga bunga parties with prostitutes that he'd been holding and Berlusconi had said well yeah I've, I do have a passion for beautiful women but at least I'm not gay and the, and the whole sort of room stood and applauded um, and uh, you know, in Italy, these things don't get the same, don't sort of generate the same outrage, or certainly didn't 10 years ago, that they do perhaps in other countries. And, you know, the other thing with Cipollini here is that he has an undeniable presence. He's a very, very good talker. Um, if, if there were no question marks about his conduct, um, either as regards doping or, you know, his private life. I think, you know, he would be on TV more because um, he, he's quite brilliant as a pundit, particularly. Um, recently, um, in the in the sort of midst of the coronavirus crisis, he's been doing a lot of charity work and he speaks incredibly passionately and incredibly well about um, cycling. But he's still being given a, a platform um, by people like La Gazzetta, who he's, he's patched things up with, which is, is kind of questionable. And, and, and you, you, you sort of ask yourself, is it appropriate that he's given that platform when, you know, the charges and, and, a, and a case is hanging over him, um, the nature of which is incredibly serious. And it simply wouldn't happen in most other countries that someone like that would be very much persona non grata. I mean, the, the other thing I suppose that is quite poignant to consider, chaps, um, is you know how Cipollini fits into this picture of a generation, you know, laid to waste, and that's not to that's not to suggest that they were sort of victims, and you know they weren't also active in what's happened to them. But if we go back and we consider 1999, if we take that, if we put a pin in 1999. Um, we think about who were the, by far, I would say, um, you, you couldn't really dispute this, who were the five biggest names in professional cycling that particular year? It would have been Lance Armstrong, Marco Pantani, Frank Vandenbroeke, Jan Ulrich and Mario Cipollini. And um, Frank Vandenbroek is dead. Marco Pantani is dead. Lance Armstrong um, needs well, no introduction. We don't need to explain what happened to him. Jan Ulrich, um, you know, a couple of years ago, he ended up in a psychiatric, on a psychiatric ward, has had well-documented problems with drugs and alcohol. Um, and then we've got Cipollini. And um, I, I, I would also add to that, though, that um, Cipollini doesn't have the expedient, he doesn't have the excuse of having been shamed publicly to the extent I think that Pantani was or you know Pantani was also a, a sensitive individual and I think Vandenbroek was as well and I think what happened to them later was partly as a result of that shame because you know they they were very much sort of confronted with their misdemeanors and and I think suffered because of that Cipollini has a, a much thicker skin it seems to me and um, you know that there is that there is no or there can be no sort of mitigation um, for you know some of the crimes that he's alleged to have committed. And I said right at the start of the the first of these two episodes that there were maybe parallels with Lance Armstrong, um, who you know reemerged in 1999 and obviously won won his seven tours to France. Um, and they were they were similar in lot in lots of respects, I suppose in the in the you know the the position they had in in the sport in the way that they used their influence and in their sort of casual disregard for the rules and we've seen that in lots of different aspects of Cipollini's life from speeding on the motorway on his bike to to other more serious transgressions um there was also the the, the comeback as well that didn't end quite so disastrously for Cipollini as it did for Lance Armstrong but nevertheless um perhaps didn't go as well as he he might have imagined it to have gone but again as a the the, the as you say um uh, daniel what the the biggest thing that perhaps connects them is that lack of a, a sense of shame perhaps uh, and that um perhaps goes a long way to explaining many of their actions well it's a complicated story that of mario cipollini and difficult to separate those uh, you know those those wins and those performances that we all enjoyed in the 90s with some of these uh, less savoury aspects of his story and his life. 
Um, but we've tried to take a, a sort of 360 uh, view of Cipollini and Ch the Cipollini story over these two episodes. Um, what have we got coming up tomorrow, Lionel? Well, tomorrow it's Italia 90. Whoa, you'll be you'll be looking it forward is. to you that. Can take, you can have a day off tomorrow, Buff. You can have a day off tomorrow. Just leave it. Me and Scotland Napalm qualified for we'll Italia 90. That. They did, that, and know. they lost 1-0 to Costa Rica in the opening game, which was one of the greatest right, days right, in football We'll get history. on to that tomorrow. <laughs> the Irish did very well. The English well, did we'll very well. The greatest World Cup ever. The football was terrible, but it was still the greatest World Cup ever. Right, and it was it was heady times for Italy um, in general. Um, Gianni Bugno won the Giro d'Italia, led it from day one to the final stage in Milan. And um, yeah, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about his Giro, and we're going to be talking about that summer in general um, in Italy, the World Cup, magic nights. We're going to learn what magic nights were, what that means to Italian. And are you going to be singing really Ness and Dorma, Daniel? Are you going to be singing Ness and Dorma? No, I, I, I am not. looking forward to not wallowing least. in a bit of nostalgia. Well, until then, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Lionel. Thanks, Richard. <laughs>